Hello learners, welcome back to the course on labor welfare and industrial relations. We move to the second lecture of module 10 uh, where we look into the wage legalities, uh, certain authorized deductions that are permitted and miscellaneous provisions. This is significant because in the previous lecture we talked about the wages, what do you mean by wages, what are the different elements that could uh, qualify itself as wage, what will not be included as wage and we substantiated that certain deductions cannot be made uh, with respect to uh, the salary or with respect to the wage. Now, what would be the technicality of these deductions if they are allowed under the ambit, are they? Let us look into that in greater detail. I am Dr. Abraham Sirlisek, I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So when you look into uh, the wage legality specifically, let us understand this authorized deduction specifically. When you are looking into section 7, the permissible deductions or deduction from wages of an employed person shall be made only in accordance with the provisions of this particular act and of the following kinds. Now specifically, we will dig deeper into the first one, the fines. When you look into fine, which is given in under section 7, uh, sub clause 2, please note, no fines shall be imposed on any employed person in respect of such acts and omissions on, on his part as the employer with the previous approval of the state government or the prescribed authority of the day and it may have been specified under the act. We also see when it comes to fine, a notice specifying such acts, whatever are the omissions, whatever are the omissions that have been made, shall be exhibited in the prescribed manner on the premises in which the employment is carried on or in case of persons employed upon a, a particular uh, place, be it factory, be it railway or whatever is a prescribed place. We also observe from the act that no fine shall be imposed on any employed person until he has been given the opportunity of showing the cause against the fine. What was the reason why the fine is supposedly given or otherwise then in accordance with such procedure as may be prescribed in the act. We also understand the total amount of fine which may be imposed in any one wage period particularly on any employed person shall not exceed an amount equal to 3 percentage, 3 percentage of the wages payable to him in respect of that particular wage period. We also see from the act that uh, certainly no fine shall be imposed on any employed person who is under the age of 15 years and no fine should be imposed on any employed person who shall be recovered from him by installments or other expiry of 60 days from the day on which it was imposed. And please note, every fine, every fine shall be deemed to have been imposed on the day of the act or omission in respect of which it was imposed. So this is particularly what the act specifies with respect to fine. When you look into the deductions that can happen in under the ambit of the absence from duty, essentially section 7 uh, sub clause 2 sub clause B is vociferous about this particular pattern of deduction. When you look into uh, these deductions that may be under the uh, may be made under the clause B of the subsection 2 of section 7, only on account of the absence of an employed person from the place or the places where by the terms of his particular or her particular employment he is required to work and such absence actually being for the whole or any part of the period during which he is so required to work. That would be the cardinal consideration that should be given while looking into the deduction. Also the amount of such deduction shall in no case bear to the wages payable to the employed person in respect of the wage period for which the deduction is made in a larger proportion than the period for which he was absent or she was absent bears to the total period. So within such period during which by the terms of his employment he was or she was required to work. And finally, if you look into the deductions part for absence of duty, we will see that provided that subject to any rules made in this behalf by the state government, if 10 or more employed persons acting in concert absent themselves without due notice because there is some concern, there is some uh, you know sync that is going on between the employees that is to say without giving the notice which is required under the terms of the contract of employment and without a reasonable cause, a reasonable 
cost. This is uh, categorically understood from the act. Such deduction from any such person may include such amount not exceeding his wages for 8 days as may by any such terms uh, be due to the employer in lieu of the due notice. So, this has been uh, what we uh, cover with respect to the act under the deductions for absence from duty. When we are looking into the third deduction, third aspect actually, deductions for damage to loss of goods expressly entrusted to the employed person for custody or loss of money for which he is required to account, a deduction under the clause C or clause O of subsection uh, 2 of this section 7 specifically, it shall not exceed, please note, the amount of the damage or loss caused to the employer by the neglect or the default of the employed person. So, when discussed the deduction shall not be made under the clause of the, if you look into the clause C uh, specifically, clause M specifically and clause N and O of this particular subsection 2 of section 7. So, this is vital section 7, subsection 2, uh, clause C, clause M, clause N or clause O of uh, these particular uh, subsection and section until the employed person has been given an opportunity of showing the cause against the deduction or otherwise than in accordance with such procedure as may be prescribed for the making of such deduction. So, you will see that all such deduction and all realizations therefore shall be recorded in a register to be kept by the person responsible for the payment of wages under section 3 in such form as it is prescribed by the act. So, you will see that the deductions for damage to loss of goods expressly entrusted to the employed person uh, for custody or loss of money for which he is required to account will have uh, to be recorded in a register that is to be kept by the person responsible for the payment of wages under this uh, section 3 specifically and not section 7, section 3 in such form as is prescribed. Now, when you look into other deductions, you have deductions uh, for house accommodation supplied by the employer or by the government or any housing board that is part and parcel of your salary. Then you have other deductions like deduction for such amenities um, and services supplied by the employer. Let us say uh, we look into a deduction under uh, uh, again section 7, subsection 2, uh, clause D, clause E. Uh, a deduction shall not be made from the wages of an employed person unless the house accommodation, amenity or service has been accepted by him. So, this is, this is very vital, just provision of that, just providing that will not be enough, rather acceptance or accepted by him as a term of employment or otherwise then only the deduction can happen and such deduction always or shall not exceed an amount equivalent to the value of the house accommodation amenity or service supplied and in case of such deduction under the set clause specifically E of subsection 2 of section 7 shall be subject to such conditions as the state government may impose. So, please note these are the possibilities of deductions and fines that can uh, or authorized deductions that the act actually entertains. When you discuss further, you will see that there are other provisions, especially deductions for recovery of advances of whatever nature. It could be including advances for, let us say, traveling elements or say, conveyance elements, etc. Or maybe deduction for recovery of loans uh, made from any fund constituted for the welfare of labor in accordance with the rules approved by the state government or it could be based on let us say deductions for recovery of loans granted by house building or other purpose approved by the state government. So, please note in this particular case especially the deductions for recovery of advances we have to refer section 7 sub clause 2 sub clause f and section 12 for this matter deduction under the clause f of subsection 2 of section 7 shall subject to certain conditions which will include recovery of an advance of money given before employment began shall be made from the first payment of wages in respect of a complete wage period 
and also no recovery shall be made of such advances given for traveling expenses recovery of let's say an advance of money given after employment began shall be subject to such conditions as the state government uh, may actually impose and also there is a provision that recovery of advances of wages not already earned shall be subject to any rules made by the the state government giving the power to the state government regulating the extent to which such advances may be given and the installment by which it may be recovered. So when you look into the entire deductions for a recovery of loans, we have deductions for recovery of loans granted under the clause FFF or sub of subsection 2 of section 7 shall be subject to any rules, any rules made by the state government regulating the extent to which such loans may be granted and rate of interest are payable thereon. When you look into other possible deductions, you have deductions for income tax payable by the employed person. We have also possibilities of deduction required to be made by order of a court or other authority competent to make such a order. So this is something which you have to understand when you look into the deductions or the possible or the authorized deductions. Now when you have or when you are discussing deductions, we have to also understand that deductions can be made for subscriptions to and for payment of advances from uh, your provident fund. Deductions for payment to cooperative societies approved by the appropriate government can be made. Deductions uh, can be made with the written authorization of person employed for payment of any, any particular premium on his LIC policy, life insurance corporation or any other policy. Deductions made with the written authorization of the employed person for the payment of his contribution to the fund constituted uh, by the employer for the trade union. There could be deductions for payment of insurance premia on certain fidelity guarantee bonds. There could be deductions allowed for recovery of losses sustained by a railway administration on the amount of acceptance by the employed person of counterfeit or base coin or mutilator or forged currency notes. So these are also categorically given with respect to the possible deductions. Now when you discuss deductions, we also see that recovery of losses sustained by the railway administration on account of the failure of the employed person to invoice, to bill, to collect or to account for the appropriate charges due to that administration is also part of the deduction. So this is essentially a part of the deduction, deductions for recovery or losses sustained by a railway administration on the account of any, on any rebates or refunds incorrectly granted by the employed person would also come under the particular aspect. We will also see that deductions made with the written authorization of the employed person for contributions to the the PM National Relief Fund or to such other funds, whatever could be as a central government may by notification bring out as part of the official gazette. Now deductions for contributions to any, any particular insurance funds actually framed by the central government for the benefit of its employees is also critical. So when you look into the act, one of the significant aspect that we would uh, you know like to understand here is that there are certain miscellaneous provisions given uh, with respect to the payment of a wages act. When we look into uh, specifically this particular lecture, we will also look into certain miscellaneous provisions of the payment of wages act. Now these are some of the critical aspects where actually certain aspects like you know the, the details regarding the wage settlements or uh, you know some delay process happens, what would be the resolution for that or let us say some protection against unlawful uh, deductions happen. So all these grievance redressal mechanisms uh, will be accounted under this miscellaneous provision. So let us look into that more deeply and more clearly. The first one is clear and detailed wage uh, statements. So when you look into the clear and detailed wage statements particularly you will see that the employers provide workers with clear and detailed wage statements along with their payments. So the act specifically mandates that the employers should provide workers with clear and detailed wage statements. These statements actually should contain essential information, let us say like period for which the wages are paid, the rate of uh, wages and the details of the deductions made. Such as the wages are paid, the rate of wages, 
and the details of deductions that are made. When you look into uh, the second important miscellaneous provision is the prohibition of delay in wage payment. So, this act explicitly prohibits any unauthorized deduction from wages or delay in wage payment. Employers are required to make all the essential timely wage payments within the prescribed wage periods ensuring that the workers receive their wages promptly and without any unwarranted or unnecessary delays. When you look into the protection against unlawful deductions, the possibilities are that the act specifies the types of deductions that employers are allowed to make from workers wages and sets limit on the amount that can be actually deducted from the salary. So, it, it certainly prohibits arbitrary or excessive deductions and ensures that the workers wages are protected from unjustifiable deductions safeguarding their actual financial well-being and finally when we look into the redressal of grievance or the grievance redressal mechanism altogether the act systematically provides a mechanism for workers to seek redressal of their grievances related to wage payment. Workers have the right to approach the appropriate authority such as labor courts or let's say tribunals to address any disputes or violations of the acts, the provisions of the act. This provision empowers workers actually to help to resolve the conflicts in a fair and a just manner. So, these are some of the miscellaneous provisions of the particular act. When you look into certain other critical aspects or critical provisions, we have certain provisions regarding the penalties for non-compliance. When you are looking into the act, it includes penalties for non-compliance with its provisions. Employers actually found guilty of contravening the act uh, can actually face fines or let's say imprisonment, ensuring that there are consequences for any violations and reinforcing the importance of adhering to the regulations in the first place. So, there are certain penalties that are being provided for non-compliance. Again, you have application of the act to contract and peace rate workers. So, basically the act extends its coverage to contract and, and peace rate workers ensuring that they are also protected under its provisions. So, this inclusion recognizes the diverse nature of employment and arrangements and seeks to ensure fair and just treatment for workers engaged in different types of work. You have also provisions for inspections. The act actually grants labor inspectors authority to conduct inspections of establishments to ensure compliance with its provisions. So, inspections help to monitor and enforce the act's regulations. Uh, it provides typically an additional layer of oversight to protect workers' rights. When you look into other uh, major provisions, there is a non-discrimination in wage payment provision. The Payment of Wages Act 1936 prohibits any discrimination in wage payment, be it based on gender, race, religion, caste or any other grounds for that matter. So, this provision promotes equal pay for equal work, ensuring that the workers receive fair and non-discriminatory wages. So, these are some of the critical aspects when you look into the uh, wage payment. When you look into the protection of wages, uh, particularly you have protection of wages in case of solvency. The act actually has provisions to protect workers wages in the event of actually employer solvency. That, that is a possible reality, especially we see now companies uh, filing for solvency. So, such cases of insolvency would actually mean that there would be such scenario emanating and it would actually be against the interest of the worker. So, in such issues or such, uh, such circumstances, it ensures, the act ensures that even if the employer faces financial difficulties or let's say they go bankrupt, workers' wages are given priority and are not compromised. There are also some right of legal heirs. When you are looking into the particular act, the act actually recognizes the rights of legal heirs to receive any unpaid wages owed to a deceased worker. So, it ensures that the rightful beneficiaries of the worker wages are not deprived of their entitlement. And finally, prohibition of fines in certain cases. There are certain provisions where the act prohibits, whereby or with the help of which the act prohibits the imposition of fines on workers in certain situations. So, categorically it aims to prevent unfair and arbitrary fines that could actually lead to exploitation or an unjust 
uh, reduction of wages. So when you look into the act more closely, you will see that there are also provisions where there are legal protections given against retaliation. Let us understand this. The act actually provides legal protection to workers. That is a fact what we have seen against any retaliation or adverse action by the employer. Now, this has been the, the principal uh, aspect why this act should be there in the first place and this is a safeguard mechanism for the employee for asserting their rights or filing complaints related to uh, wage payments. So, if it safeguards workers from actually being victimized for seeking recourse under the act. So, uh, let us say tomorrow a set of employees go and take a legal recourse, at, uh, you know, suggesting or seeking or invoking the provisions of the act and there might be some intentional targeting. So, all those aspects are protected uh, by uh, the act in itself. The power to make rules. When you look into the act, it empowers certainly uh, the appropriate government to make rules and regulations to further implement and enforce the provisions of the act. So, these rules may include, you know, specific guidelines to actually uh, specific guidelines or let us say procedures and forms to actually ensure effective compliance with the act's requirement. And finally, when you look into the provisions of the act, there, is pro there are provisions for extension of the act to other establishments also. So, the act allows the government to extend its provisions to other establishments or industries as deemed necessary. This flexibility enables the act's coverage to be expanded to ensure that the workers in various sectors actually are protected by the particular act and its provisions. So, these additional aspects of the Payment of Wages Act 1936 reinforces its objective of providing comprehensive protection and a regulation of wage payments. So, they address specific issues that we have seen. So, this is what the takeaway should be from the lecture. We have seen that there could be specific issues. What happens when the company is insolvent? What happens when the company goes bankrupt? What happens when there are intentionally, you know, the workers are targeted when you are going against the employer for non-payment or for, you know, unwarranted deduction, illegal deduction. If there is some targeting happening, you are being targeted because you have taken the use of, you have tried to explore the possibilities under the act. So, all these aspects are categorically covered under this act in itself. So, it is a very futuristic act. It not only gives the worker a certain level of, uh, let us say, assurance to work because this much would be your salary or this much would be your wage and it will unequivocally undoubtedly come to you. But more than that, it is more futuristic. What will happen if, you know, some unwarranted, unsolicited deductions are made? So, what will be the scenario? What will be the outcome of that? So, all such scenarios are also taken into consideration, especially the miscellaneous provisions of the Act are very uh, relevant in this particular context. So, that should be the key takeaway from this class. Thank you for listening to me patiently. We will see with more details of this act and other welfare measures in the next class. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.